Hello, everyone, and welcome to Slash Home Daily for Tuesday, January 15th, 2019. On today's episode, we're going to talk about some film and TV news for the first time in, I think, three weeks. This is Slash Home Editor-in-Chief Peter Soretta, and joining me on today's podcast is Slash Home Senior Writer Ben Pearson. Hey, what's going on? And writer Chris Evangelista. Hello. Guys, uh, I don't even remember how to do this. It's been so long since we've done a news episode. But uh, on, on the other hand, I've been stuck in my closet for the last 24 hours. I recorded our water cooler episode yesterday. I recorded a three-hour-long slash film cast 500th episode last night. And now I'm back in the closet again to record this news episode. So, Is uh, there a reason you, you record in the closet? Is it just the only place you can record? or? Um, no, I kind of built a... I think I, I sent photos of this like a year ago, but it's probably, you know, the last year has felt like five years or 10 years, yes. so you probably yeah. forget. But I built like this recording studio in my closet, which I don't even think helps. Honestly, like I feel like <laughs> I could be recording. The problem is I live in a loft apartment and um, because it has high ceilings, there's a lot of echo. So uh. the only two places that like have kind of smaller rooms are my bedroom and uh, I have, like, a huge walk-in closet, so I've turned, like, the very end of that into a recording studio. By turn it into a recording studio, I just mean I put a microphone on a boom arm and put some uh, of those noise-reflecting uh, or, or absorbing, absorbing yeah. uh, foam things on the walls. So right. It's, it's not, like, you know, professional, it's, but... It's not like Abbey Road Studios is what you're yeah. saying. There's no door. <laughs> there's no... Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's, yeah, a far cry, a far cry. Um, uh, okay, let's get into the news, though, uh, because we had a bunch of news, and we're going to talk about some news even from last week, because we haven't had a news episode in a while, but we had a ton of news yesterday, and, uh, last night was one of the b big ones that, uh, Chris McQuarrie is returning for another Mission Impossible movie. Actually, not just one, but two. Ben, tell us about it. Yes, Chris McQuarrie, who wrote and directed both Mission Impossible Rogue Nation and last year's Mission Impossible Fallout, which is one of, I think, our the site's favorite movies of last year, uh, is coming back to film two Mission Impossible movies. And for the first time ever, they're going to actually shoot back to back. Um, one of the reports in Variety said, not unlike the Avengers movies that are, you know, uh, Avengers Infinity War and, and Avengers Endgame, I think that production took a small break in between. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if something like that happened here. But yes, the I mean, that's great news for those of us who loved Fallout because Macquarie has been, you know, sort of the... the uh, <laughs> <laughs> the brainchild behind the, the, the recent bubble. resurgence yeah, yeah of, the, of the Mission Impossible franchise. Uh, obviously, Tom Cruise is coming back. Um, Story-wise, this puts it in a really interesting place because uh, McQuarrie is the guy who created Rebecca Fer Ferguson's Ilsa Faust character, and he's very protected or pr protective of that character. He, you can, you know, if you've listened to him talk in, in interviews or, or uh, podcast episodes or anything like that, it's clear that he loves that character and the relationship that she has with uh, Tom Cruise's Ethan Hunt. And now that at the end of Fallout, um, Ethan's relationship arc with Julia, his wife, has been completed, there's now room for sort of a full-blown romance if they choose to go in that direction. Um, in terms of the actual hard facts, we know that uh, uh, Mission Impossible 7, which doesn't have a title yet, is aiming for a summer 2021 release, and Mission Impossible 8 is going to be coming into theaters the next summer, so 2022. Um, and yeah, like I said, you know, two back to back, uh, uh, Macquarie is coming back to both write and direct both of these entries. So, um, you know, for a franchise that began with different people coming in for every movie, it's completely done a 180 yeah. and just, you know, this has become Chris Macquarie's zone here. But, uh, as somebody who loves what he's done with the franchise, it's really, really hard to be angry about that. Or I find it difficult to be, yeah. but what do you guys think about that? Well, you mentioned these podcast interviews and all of these interviews, it seemed like Chris Macquarie was done with this franchise. <laughs> it was like, this was, and I, I think this was the perfect ending for him. He kind of, uh, you know, this last movie was kind of a sequel to all of the other movies and kind of, uh, except for that character that you mentioned, Ben, I think like kind of closed the books on a lot of it. Um, I, I love Christopher McQuarrie. I, you know, I, I remember, uh, was his first film way of the gun? 
Yes. I believe. Yeah, I remember watching that uh, back in the day when I first got it on DVD and loving, even loving that. And I, I'm kind of a little bit disappointed because I would like to see other Chris McQuarrie movies, but he makes some incredible Mission Impossible movies. Uh, so I guess that's not a, a, you know, not a bad thing. But I also kind of dug the original appeal of the Mission Impossible movies where it would be, you know, a director would come in and do their version of Mission Impossible with Tom Cruise. I feel I feel like that kind of episodic nature was kind of fun, and we're kind of losing that. Chris, uh, do you have any thoughts on this? You know, I, I, I'm a huge fan of Mission Impossible. I, I wrote a huge uh, write-up of the entire franchise. Uh, I love what Christopher McQuarrie has done with it. Even before he started directing, he was basically – uh, doing script work on previous films. Like they brought him in because Tom Cruise has a great relationship with him uh, to do some rewrites on earlier films. And he, you know, he knows the franchise inside and out. And while I, I did like the idea originally where there was like a different auteur for every film, you know, Brian De Palma and John Woo. And, you know, but at the same time, I feel like um, Rogue Nation and Fallout, even though they're directed by the same guy and they even have, the same characters, which is something all the other Mission Impossible movies don't really do. They really feel like two different movies. Like they don't. And I remember in one of those many interviews uh, Macquarie did, he said he deliberately brought in a different DOP because he wanted the movie to look different than Rogue Nation. So I think if he keeps that up and he keeps making the movies look and feel like their own thing, I'm I'm all for it. At the same time, I really, really do not want Ethan Hunt and Ilsa Foss to get together because I love Ilsa Foss as a character. And I think what makes the relationship so cool so far is that she and Ethan Hunt really aren't romantically linked. I mean, you know, they have their flirty moments, but I like the idea that she's like this independent character who doesn't, you know, really need to be in a relationship. I just want her to like, you know, show up and and kill people with her legs. Like I don't, I don't need her to, <laughs> to fall into a relationship with, with Ethan Hunt. And I feel like Ethan Hunt works better as like a single character anyway. Like he, he when is he going to have time for romance? He's always running around <laughs> and jumping on stuff. So, uh, you know, beyond that though, I, I'm pumped. I'm excited. I wish it were coming out sooner. I, I hate that we have to wait till 2021. Yeah. That seems like it's well, so well, far away. Well, maybe they're actually going to write a script for this one before they start shooting. <laughs> Yeah, they could do that, but you know, it, it's worked out so well where they, they start they started the last two movies without a script, and yeah. both of the films or without turned a out completed be, script, I should say. Yeah, without a completed script, and they they both turned out really well. So maybe that's a formula that, that works for them. Yeah, I, I kind of wonder. Well, first of all, do, do you think because they're filming these back to back, we might we might get like an Avengers Infinity War style cliffhanger? For this, for the first time in the history of this franchise, I, I know that we've had, we now have actual sequels to these films, like uh, films that continue storylines and have stuff like that in this franchise. Do you think like they might end it at, at a kind of cliffhanger point? That's something that I speculated about in the article. Is this going to be designed as one huge story that's told across two films, or is each one going to feel distinct and sort of satisfying? I That's a really good question. I feel like because this has never happened in Mission Impossible history before, where somebody has been uh, signed on for two movies in a row, I guess, you know, he he could do a big cliffhanger, and, and since, especially... Just like Avengers, since the next movie is going to come out that next summer, audience audiences won't have to wait that long to find out the answer to whatever question they pose at the end. Um, I really hope that, they, that he brings Tandy Newton back because I think they, somebody posed that question to him during the Fallout uh, interview junket cycle. And he was talking about how great she was. And she was, for those of you who don't remember, was the female lead in Mission Impossible, in Mission Impossible 2, um, the John Woo one. And you know, that that character is still could theoretically still be around and bringing her in and maybe having like Ethan and Julia face off against Tandy Newton's uh, Naya Nordoff Hall character would be pretty amazing. So I don't know. I feel like there's a lot of uh, McCory loves stuff like that, too. You know, and, and like Chris said, he knows his franchise backwards and forwards. So um, I don't know. Chris, what do you think? Do you think the, about the, the cliffhanger question? Uh, I really don't want them to do that because I like the movie sitting on their own, but at the same time, if, if it's done well, I won't complain. And jumping off the, the Tandy Newton thing, one of my dreams for this franchise is like a spin-off movie 
where all the female characters who are still alive get together and form like their own super group because I mean Paula Patton's character, she's still alive. They can yeah. bring her back. Like bring all those women back and give them their own movie. And I will I will watch the hell out of that film with <laughs> Ilsa Foss like as the leader of the team. Oh, that would be interesting. Uh what do you think the Vegas odds are on Tom Cruise getting seriously injured or killed in the next uh, two back-to-back movies. I, I'm very curious to see how he's going to, like, you know, obviously the joke is, like, he's going to go to space. Like, I don't know what what is there left for him to do. I'm sure we'll know soon enough where he starts planning something very dangerous. Um, I hope he doesn't die. <laughs> that, would be, <laughs> that would be upsetting. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if he gets yeah. injured again, but I, I, sure, I sure hope yeah. Tom Cruise doesn't die because – that will put a serious damper yeah. on the Mission Impossible franchise. I, I just think it's funny because I saw a headline somewhere that was like uh, th- about this news that was like Chris McQuarrie wants to kill Tom Cruise, signs up for back to back Mission Impossible. <laughs> I, um, but we should probably move on because we talked about this movie for ten minutes. Um, let's move on to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Uh, they're rebooting this yet again. Um, it's kind of funny because a lot of uh, – speaking of headlines on other sites, a lot of people ran with this news saying, you know, a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle reboot is coming from the producers of A Quiet Place. And I love how that, like, frames it. It almost frames it as if it's, like, new producers are coming in to produce this reboot. But it's it's the same producers. And, Chris, your headline actually kind of made fun of that in a way. <laughs> Yes, I, I'm I'm on to the ruse. And so uh, uh, Brad Fuller and Andrew Form, who are from uh, Platinum Dunes, uh, they produced the previous two live action uh, Ninja Turtle films, which I think a lot of people forget because they get lumped into being Michael Bay movies, even though Michael Bay didn't even direct them. He just, you know, he's listed as a producer. So Platinum Dunes has already made two Ninja Turtle movies. And rather than making a third entry in their already established franchise, uh, Foreman Fuller uh, sort of let slip on, on the red ca- carpet for the, the Critics' Choice Awards that they're rebooting yet again. So I guess they're going to start all over again. I guess we're going to have brand new turtle designs, which is good because uh, the designs in those two movies are awful and the turtles look like horrible monsters and <laughs> it's, it's look really bad so i'm guessing they're gonna try and make something that looks a little more cl- like like the classic turtles or more like that you know that that 80s or i guess it was 1990 live action movie where they look more like they're supposed to and so yeah i guess we'll, we'll see what happens there but that that's where it is as of now the the same people who already rebooted in <laughs> turtles are rebooting it again but but this is after they've done a quiet place so maybe it'll be better no, I don't know. Uh, Maybe, yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, you could feel Michael uh, Bay's influence on those Ninja Turtle movies. At least it seemed like he had his, like, animatics guy for the action scenes invo- involved in those action scenes. Uh, do, do we know, is, is is Bay still heavily involved in the Platinum Dunes movies? I don't like, think so. I think they're distancing the Yeah, thing that's Because what I, I know he, has, he doesn't have a credit on A Quiet Place, and I know... Platinum Dunes is doing that new Dora the Explorer movie, and they made a point of saying Michael Bay is not involved with this either. So I, I, I think he's sort of distant, going away from Platinum Dunes. I don't know. So do you think, you know, now that Bay is probably not involved in this, do you think it's going to turn out any better? No, absolutely not. These, <laughs> how can you, you you can't make a good one of these films anymore? It's just impossible. I, you know, I'll admit I have a soft spot for that '90s movie because it was weirdly like dark and gritty, and they will never do something like that again. You know, they have to sell toys, so I, I sincerely doubt it'll be good. But I, I guess it, stranger things have happened. If they if they've managed to hire a really interesting director, like, you know, like they hired like Jordan Peele, like Jordan Peele's Ninja Turtles. <laughs> I'd be like, all right, I'm seeing that. But uh, as of now, I have my doubts. Ninja Turtles represent race and racism in America in this new. Team. Yes. If they do something like smart with it. Yeah. But I, I really doubt they, they no, will I do know. that. Like, yeah. Um, yeah, we should move on to another thing, uh, another bit of big news, and that is that our friend and director, Dan Trachtenberg, the director of 10 Cloverfield Lane, has been hired to direct a movie based on the Uncharted video game franchise. Now, I, I know he's not 
the first person to be hired here. He comes in a long line, but it actually looks like it's happening. Uh, ben, what do we know? Yes, yeah, so David O. Russell, Neil Berger, Seth Gordon, and Sean Levy have all at various points been attached to direct Uncharted, which is an adaptation of Sony's really popular video game, which is basically like an action adventure a modern day adventure story sort of in the vein of Indiana Jones. Um, these games are incredible. And now Dan Trachtenberg, who directed 10 Cloverfield Lane, he's directed uh, the playtest episode of Black Mirror. And he also directed the pilot for uh, Amazon's The Boys, which is coming up soon. He has, has been hired to direct this film. This is kind of amazing because... A, Dan Trachtenberg has, uh, you know, a big history with video games. He, he sort of broke out directing a, a uh, short film adaptation of another video game called Portal. Uh, his short was called Portal No Escape, and that really, like, sort of put him on Hollywood's radar a few years ago. And... Um, and so he and he also used to host a uh, like a pop culture video game or co-host a video game show called The Totally Rad Show, which Jeff Canato, who's now on the Slash Filmcast, was a co-host with him. And actually, in our article, we embedded this video in December of 2007. He was talking about when Uncharted, the first video game was to come out or it was going to come out. He was talking about how he wished he could direct an Uncharted movie. And now that that, that uh, announcement has come true. So um, it's pretty amazing. We know that it's not going to be a straight adaptation of any of the video games because it's going to be focusing on a younger version of the protagonist who is a treasure hunting adventurer named Nathan Drake, who's a descendant of Sir Francis Drake, the explorer. Uh, Tom Holland from Avengers Infinity War and Spider-Man and all that stuff is going to be playing this young version of Nathan Drake. And I think those are the only... Uh, you know, we, we know Trachtenberg's directing, Tom Holland is starring, and new writers uh, Mark Walker and John Rosenberg are, are on board to rewrite a script that was previously written by Joe Carnahan and a bunch of other people. So um, yeah. we don't know if they're doing like a page one rewrite or anything, but they, those guys previously worked with uh, Trachtenberg on a movie called Crime of the Century, which is a time travel thriller that hasn't been produced yet, but he's been working on for, for several years at this point. So all of this sounds really, really great to me. I feel like Trachtenberg is like the perfect uh guy for this movie and hopefully he can finally bring it across the finish line and that clip you mentioned actually wasn't from a preview of uh, uncharted that was i think their year-end review where he was like saying that was i think his favorite video game of that year so he was like a huge fan of this video game uh so much so i, I when we recently got a playstation 4 i think last year um Kitra was considering my girlfriend Kitra was considering buying an Uncharted and I was in a text chat with him and he he just like bought it for her he was like go play this you need to play this so um <laughs> uh he he is a huge fan of uh this series I I and I, I think that's good because and he's also one of those kind of people that I um feel like even though he's a fan he's not uh, completely married to like what it need like what it was in the video game form like he has that kind of separation um, which I think is good but the interesting thing here I think is uh, and we knew this already that Tom Holland is playing Nathan Drake uh, I know a lot of fans out there wanted uh, Nathan Fillion, Fillion. Yeah. yeah which I, I think seems too obvious and on the nose and he's a little cheesy but well uh, they made that short yeah. uh earlier last year so you can watch that if you're if you're trying to scratch yeah. that particular itch yeah so uh, this is gonna be a younger one which i think is smart in some ways because it is going to differentiate itself from the indiana jones movie that steven spielberg is making right like i, I feel like the the trouble with un making an uncharted movie is it's kind of based on indiana jones and it could be very easily seem like you know kind of a a uh xerox copy you know changed <laughs> a little uh i know that's not what it is um but it could seem that way and especially making him younger and I i'm assuming this be you know being a guy kind of like in out of his element and like nathan drake becoming nathan drake now i'm just reading between the lines of tom holland ca uh, casting i'm assuming that's that that's a, a cool way of doing it uh Chris, do you have any experience with this video game? Or are you excited about this at all? Uh, I, I've never played the game. I am excited that Dan Trachtenberg is making another movie because I really liked um, 10 Cloverfield Lane. I've been waiting for him to do more things. The, uh, the, the one thing that gives me pause is if they are doing that origin story, I think that's kind of... Uh, boring. That's what the, the, the recent Tomb Raider movie did. Like The whole movie was about her 
becoming Tomb Raider. And then at the end, she's like, now I'm the Tomb Raider. And it's like, just <laughs> just get to it. We don't, we don't need to see how you became this thing. Just start by being the thing. And that's what we want to say. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I envision that this is the, the first and hope, a hopeful franchise for Sony is, I think, what they're probably going for. And, uh, and real quickly, not to drag this out anymore, uh, I've played all four of the Uncharted video games, and there is uh, there are a few scenes, a few playable moments throughout the franchise where it, the game flashes back and you do see a young version of Nathan Drake, and he is sort of like... He's, he's like a good kid who is like corrupted a little bit by his brother, and, and so you see him sort of becoming a thief at a young age. So there is some... You know, like a little bit of of uh, game store source material, I guess, for them to bounce off of. But I, I really think it's more just like they're going to try to capture the essence of the character and tell a whole new story. I think. Yeah, I I'm excited about anything Dan Tra- Trachtenberg makes. I'm just a little nervous because, you know, there is. I think there is something to this video game curse. I think, and I I know we've talked about this on the past and on the podcast. But I do think that, you know, the video game medium is such a different medium and there's good storytelling in that medium that it just doesn't translate into the medium of film. And we haven't seen a really great video game movie adaptation yet, uh, but I am hopeful that Dan Trachtenberg could be be the, the one to, uh, you know, break down that, that, that wall. I mean, it is it, – like – I'm I'm trying to think of a way to phrase this. Like, it is eventually going to happen, right? Like, there, like, it's not always going to be like we had how many years of of uh, comic book movies that were maybe not bad, but not great. Do you know what I mean? Even when mm-hmm. they were good, when they were like Tim Burton's Batman, they were not like you know the level of art that like you know the Dark Knight was. So I I think it's it's eventually going to happen. It's just a matter of when and where, and uh, maybe maybe it'll be this one. Uh, but let's move on to another bit of news. This is kind of shocking that uh, Aaron Sorkin wants to develop a sequel to The Social Network. This is one of my favorite movies from a few years ago. Uh, Chris, what is going on here? Uh, yeah, during a recent interview, Aaron Sorkin said, uh, I'm paraphrasing, but he said he thinks the time is right for a social network sequel. And this isn't just wishful thinking either, because he also says that uh, Scott Rudin, who produced the social network, has emailed him several times and said pretty much the same thing. Like, we, sh- we should make a sequel. Um, obviously, a lot has changed uh, with Facebook. You know, at the, uh, Social Network came out in 2010. And since then, Facebook has been uh, in the news for a lot of bad things. There's privacy issues. There's uh, selling data. There's the whole 2016 election where they more or less allowed Russia to post tons of disinformation to swing the election. Uh, a lot has happened with with Facebook. So based on that, Aaron Sorkin is saying, like, you know, the time is now. Let's let's go back to this story. Let's let's update uh, how how further from grace Mark Zuckerberg has fallen? Yeah, I, I, I've said this uh, like on this podcast before, but uh, Blake Harris, who writes for the site uh, currently, uh, uh, occasionally, um, is writing a new book. He's the guy that did Console Wars. Um, it's a new book on like Palmer Lucky and VR, and I, I I really feel like if if Sorkin was going to be making a sequel to The Social Network, they should sign a deal to incorporate some of this book because I feel like this would be the, per- it would be a perfect spiritual s- successor sequel that would also feature an older Mark Zuckerberg, if that makes sense. Um, but would a social network sequel be good without David Fincher is the question. No, if they're going to do this, they need to get David Fincher back. He's, he's the secret ingredient, even though, you know, the social network had a great script because Aaron Sorkin is a very good writer and the actors were all good. What made that movie so fantastic really is David Fincher's direction and, you know, like the soundtrack and all that stuff. But again, if if you're going to do this movie, you have to get Fincher back. And if he's if they do do it and he doesn't come back, I don't know if I'd even be interested, honestly. Chris, are you trying to say that the new Dragon Dad 2 movie wasn't any good? Uh, I haven't seen it yet, but yes, that's that's what I am saying. <laughs> ben, any thoughts here? 
no, I echo exactly what you guys have, ta- have said. Yeah. Um, also in the news last week was uh, the Final Destination is also getting rebooted, but this time from the writers of the Saw Saw franchise. Ben, what is going on? Yeah, so Patrick Melton and Marcus Dunstan, who have written four Saw movies, and, uh, I mean, they have a bunch of horror credits under their belt. They wrote the Feast films, Piranha 3, Double D, the upcoming scary stories to tell in the dark. Uh, They are now rebooting Final Destination, which uh, this movie, or this franchise, uh, started in 2000 and wrapped up in 2011. It seemed like it was finally dead for a while, but... Now the studio is bringing it back. Uh, this is going to be a reimagining of the franchise. We don't know exactly what that means, what the extent of that reimagining is going to be. But for those who uh, somehow were under a rock for the entire 2000s, the Final Destinations movies are basically um, <laughs> about uh, groups of people who manage to avoid dying in a really horrific accident. And then death, the personification of death sort of uh, comes and hunts all of them like a serial killer, killing off each one in horrific and ridiculous ways. So Yeah, it's uh, just an excuse to have, like, these elaborate, like, almost, um, oh, my God, what is that? Like Rube Goldberg. Yeah, Rube Goldberg, like, contraptions that kill people in in, uh, interesting and fun ways. Yeah, so with that, you know, with that said, it sort of makes sense that they're going after Patrick Melton and Marcus Dunstan, who have written, like I said, four Saw sequels, which those movies sort of, you know, eventually ramped up the Rube Goldberg ridiculousness in terms of the elaborate kills and all that stuff uh, in the later Saw films as well. So um, at least it seems like there's some shared DNA between the work that they've done in the past and what uh, the studio hopes that they do with Final Destination. So we we don't know anything about who might direct or star yet, but um, this is happening. And I, I've got guys. My first thought about this was that New Line might look at this as sort of uh, a low budget franchise that has you know easy re- name recognition and like they can make it really cheaply and probably make a decent profit on it. And they might like cast a YouTube star or something oh, in the lead. No. So I, I really hope that doesn't happen. But uh, I feel like if there's a franchise that could get rebooted where, you know, it really, the characters don't matter. It's just the kills. They they could easily just grab somebody from, you know, an Instagram influencer to star in the lead of this thing. So I really hope that that doesn't happen, but we'll have to see what how it goes. You know, I actually enjoyed the Final Destination movies. I remember seeing the first one. When did that come out? Late 90s, I guess, probably. I think it was I think it was the year 2000 was the, year 2000. One, was the first one. Yeah. Um, and I remember there's this shot in the movie of like, I think like the main character had like one of those luggage tags on his luggage and uh, someone ripped it off. And there was, like, this close-up of, like, ripping off the, the luggage tag. And, like, there's kind of this implication if you've ripped off your luggage tag, you die in, uh, you know, the flight you were going on. Uh, so for years, I just had luggage tags on my luggage, like, just many luggage tags. I refused <laughs> to rip them off out of, I don't know, some kind of ridiculous... Uh, no, I know what yeah. you're talking about because there one of the kills in this <laughs> franchise was uh, somebody driving behind a huge truck that had a bunch of like tree logs in it, and then I, I forget what happens. Somebody slams on the brakes, and one of the logs comes through and like decapitates yes. someone. And I, and anytime I'm driving and I see one of those vehicles, <laughs> I am like, I there's no way in hell that I'm getting behind that thing. So I know what you're saying it's irrational, yeah. but uh, the movies have have left an impact. Chris, you're the resident horror guy slash film. Uh, what do you think of the Final, Des- of Final Destination series? And ha- have you had any of that ir- irrational um, actions because of it? Uh, I, I I really like the Final Destination series. Um, I'd probably never rewatch the first one now because of my crippling phobia of planes. I mean, I'm already scared of, of flying now, and the first one has a very uh, graphic uh, display of a, a plane exploding and everyone burning to death on it. So I will probably never watch that one again. Um, I think I had the same thing that Ben had, where if I ever see like a, a tree truck on the roads, um, I <laughs> immediately think of that scene in, in the second one, which I think I think the second one is the best one in the franchise because it's the, the most inventive. I um, uh, I don't know if we need a reboot of this because even though the original series had loosely connected themes, you could easily just make a new sequel. You're like you don't have to reboot it, but I guess that's just the 
the way it goes. So I guess we'll see. Yeah. Um, let's move on to one last story. Let's get to one last story. Let's talk about John Lasseter, who, you know, his time at Disney officially came to an end at the end of last year, and it only took him six days to find a new job. Ben, tell us about it. Yeah, so uh, after a year away from Disney, after a public fallout uh, over misconduct allegations, John Lasseter has a new high-profile job at a totally different company. He has been hired to run Skydance Animation, which is the animation branch of Skydance Entertainment, which is the company that you might recognize for producing tentpole action movies like uh, Mission Impossible and the Star Trek films. So David Ellison, who's the the head of Skydance, uh, hired Lasseter to take over as the head of this uh, branch and almost immediately uh, Time's Up, which is the organization that um, is <laughs> like the... <laughs> I guess what's the the organiz- organization that seeks to provide safe working environments for women in Hollywood and beyond is I think what their their official website says. They immediately came out and said, "What the hell are you doing? This is a terrible idea. Why why are you doing this?" So, uh, I mean, guys, this is sort of like yeah. a minefield. We've talked about this before with the Laster thing when that originally came yeah, up. It, it, it's tough because it's not clear cut. There's not a uh you know, official allegations from people who came out, but there's obviously people that spoke to uh, reporters uh, without saying their names. There was reportings of, you know, groping, touching, uh, a lot of hugging. Uh, Yeah, unwanted hugs, yeah, yeah, kisses, uh, stuff like that. There was some uh, unequal environment created at Pixar, at least that's the accusation. Um, But on the other hand, there... I, as far as I know, there hasn't been anybody that says that uh, it went beyond the touching point. Not that that's to say, but it's. I'm just trying to say, like you know, it's not. Uh, it's not as deep as you know Harvey Weinstein. Um, but uh, on, on the other hand, it was enough for him to step down at the Walt Disney Company, uh, and there was you know he created an environment that, uh, from all accounts, uh, was uncomfortable for women. Um, so hiring him at this other organization in a leadership role is, uh, and especially, you know, directly after, after, you know, he hasn't had time. Like, I feel like, I feel like they should have waited. There should have been time for him to, uh, make some sort of restitution. Yeah. Like, I, I don't know. I don't know how you, you say it, but like, like why not come on as a consultant? Why is he like leading up? Like, I don't know. It just seems like a bad situation. I don't know. Uh, Chris, do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, this is uh, bullshit. He should not. <laughs> he should not have been hired to do like he got a. I'm, I'm pretty sure if I remember clearly, he got like a huge payout to leave Dizzy. It's not like they were like so long, buddy. Like they gave yeah. him a, a lot of money. Like, just take that money and, and just go do something else. There's this weird uh, misconception where people get accused of this stuff and the defense seems to be like, oh, what? Should they never be allowed to work again? It's like, well, yeah, he can go do whatever he wants. Like, he doesn't have to be working in this industry anymore. Let him go do something completely different where he's not leading people like this. It's just a it's a I, I'm going to play devil's advocate here, even though I don't. I don't, okay, I, I feel uncomfortable playing Devil's Advocate. Yeah, but there's if, no. If, if, if you love animation, if you're someone that like animation has been your life the whole time, uh, for your entire life, and like you want to stay in that industry, what would be the best thing for someone like John Lasseter to do after you know post Disney? Then uh, I don't know. Maybe stop uncomfortably hugging people <laughs> and making people uncomfortable. Yes. I mean, that might. If you want to stay in your industry, just don't be a creep. That's really the answer. Like, just don't. Again, I know there haven't been official allegations against him, yeah. but there's there's clearly enough here to, to hint that something happened. You know, people don't yeah. just make this stuff up. So, you yeah. Know, just... And and uh, David Ellison, the the head of Skydance, you know, he addressed his company and said, like, I know that it, I'll read his quote here. He said, I know many of you are aware of John's admitted mistakes and his 
prior role helming those studios. John has been forthright in taking ownership of his behavior, apologized for his actions, and has spent the past year on sabbatical analyzing and improving his workplace behavior. We employed outside counsel to thoroughly investigate the allegations. Um, you know, they're they're taking it seriously, blah, blah, blah. But Time's Up, I feel like, has a really good statement about this. And, and maybe we can just wrap this up with, with their statement, which is Skydance Media's decision to hire John Lasseter as head of animation endorses and perpetuates a broken system that allows powerful men to act without consequence. At a moment when we should be uplifting the many talented voices who are consistently underrepresented, Skydance Media is providing another position of power, prominence, and privilege to a man who has repeatedly been accused of sexual ha harassment in the workplace. People often ask when a man who has abused his power gets to come back. There is no simple answer, but here are a few first steps. Demonstrate true remorse. Work deeply to reform your behavior. Deliver restitution to those you harmed. That's the bare minimum. Yeah. So that's that's part of their statement, and I think that that's exactly right. Like the you know that and there hasn't been enough time or a dis, a public display or or even a private display like anybody reporting like oh hey look at what John Lasseter is doing to make amends for these mistakes that he's made. He's just sort of like sat there and and sat in the corner for a little while until he thought enough time had passed. And Skydance must be really desperate to get somebody in there if if they just hired him immediately after his contract with Disney yeah. <laughs> expired. I don't know. What do you think about this, Peter? It, it, it's tough because I, I do think Jeff, John Lasseter in the creative side of things is, is a genius. Like you see what he did with not only Pixar – but also Walt Disney Animation Studios, which was kind of in a huge slump, and he kind of turned that company around. Um, but on the other side of things, you know, empowering someone that has these kind of accusations against them into a, a place of power is, you know, six days after, you know, his contract with Disney expired. Like, it, it, what message does that send? Uh, I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I don't... Um, I'm not sure I even endorse him coming on as a consultant, but like I feel like if he was on as a consultant, a creative consultant, like that was that would be a little bit more uh digestible. I guess yeah. because like he's coming in, you know, the people work like you know, like Guillermo del Toro is a consultant at DreamWorks. He's not there every day. He comes in, they show him like a, you know, rough thing of like animatics and stuff and he gives his notes and he leaves. And like that's what a consultant does and I feel like Someone like Laster has uh, the smarts to help a company like this, like, you know, skyrocket their or, you know, kickstart their animation division. And I mean, I guess even hiring him in that capacity, there is it's problematic, but hiring him in the position of a leadership role where he's going to be in charge of women this soon after just seems bad. It seems. Bad. Yeah, I think that's well said. Yeah. Uh, okay. Anyway, so we're going to end this on a, a, I guess, I guess a negative note, but I think we had a lot of fun on this podcast. Um, we've been getting a lot of emails and tweets and uh, saying how much you guys loved our writer's room episodes. We're going to try to do more of those. We actually will have one tomorrow discussing our most anticipated new uh, TV shows of the year. So you can look out for that. Uh, but I want to thank you all for listening. Uh, please, if you want to find any more of any of these stories, go to SlashFilm.com. This podcast, Slash Film Daily, is published on iTunes, Google Play, Overcast, Spotify, all the popular podcast apps every weekday. Send us your feedback, questions, comments, concerns to us at Peter at SlashFilm.com. We'll actually get to some more life advice from Chris in the coming days now that things are kind of cooling down. And uh, please, uh, if you do, email us. Leave your name and general geographic location in case we mention the email on the air. Go to our iTunes page. Write us a couple sentences. Give us five stars. Tell your friends. Spread the word. And we'll see you tomorrow.